stay in the church, doesn't want the peg, decides they're going to hang out in the building that they're in right now. When everybody splits, the second deacon who had the problem decides he's going to go in the back of the vestibule and remove the peg out of the wall. Thus the name, No Peg Baptist Church. It's amazing, isn't it? When people get their feelings and their emotions into so, so much of this, think about how churches or what churches divide over today. Music is a great point of division in the church today. You can't play that. You shouldn't paint it. What your pastor wears, he, he preaches too long or he doesn't wear a suit. I have people who are like, well, I can't come to Berea. And I'm like, why? Because you don't wear a suit. And I'm like, okay. If you want to wear a suit, by all means, wear a suit. Was that Noah up there talking? I hear you, Noah. I hear you. <laughs> but my whole thing is this. It has to be about Jesus. We could get so legalistic. Remember we talked about that? And what I love about here is it's not about the legalistic side of things. It's about loving Jesus and making sure that people know how, the, the, the truth of the gospel. So we're to live peacefully with each other. We know that, there's, that, that people are going to want to create division. We know that people are going to want to create frustration. I'm thankful that there's so many peacemakers here because there's so many peace breakers in the rest of the world. They want to create hardship and difficulty everywhere that they go. Now, look, there, there are mean people everywhere. There are people who are going to refuse to let you live peacefully with them. That's why Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 12. He said this, verse 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. You know, I've often said that lawyers like this verse because it contains a loophole. The command is to live at peace with everyone. But the loophole is this, as much as it depends upon you, we have the responsibility to live at peace with everyone, to not go in there creating strife or difficulty with anyone. Is there another person, another believer in your life right now where there's a wall that stands up between you and that person? If it's there, you have the biblical responsibility, according to what Scripture is teaching us, to go and attempt to restore that. Now, if they choose not to, that's not your responsibility. You can't make people do what they don't want to do. But you have to do your part. You have to be willing to take that chance. And I get it. I understand it. Maybe they hurt you. Maybe they bothered you. Maybe they offended you. Maybe it was so bad years ago that you haven't been able to restore anything. But listen to the person you're focusing on when we make those excuses. It's us. My feelings were hurt. I was bothered. I, but believe me, I get it. The challenges are there. When I left church for years, I, I blamed it on one particular person. A mentor friend of mine who abandoned me in the frustration and I was like, I'm not going back because it's his fault he didn't come and do this. That man had no idea I was angry and mad at him. The only one who was frustrated and bitter at this point was me. And God nailed me in the head. He was like, you need to go back and talk. So I went back. You know what's amazing now is that man is my friend. When we have, it's fascinating, we have truth presented to us in God's word on how to how to address the hardship. You ever had a disagreement with somebody? Some of y'all are like, I'm in the middle of one right now. And they're sitting right next to me. It's so hard. It's, it's interesting. It's so funny. I, I always talk to this when I do marriage counseling with folks. You know, premarital counseling. We're sitting there. We're talking about married life. And there are going to be times where you're going to disagree. I know you're in the new phase of marriage and everything seems fantastic. And you're always going to agree on everything. There's going to come a point. It may be years down the road where you won't agree on everything. So how do you respond in the midst of those disagreements? Some people will just isolate. They push away. Don't talk to me for a day. Don't talk to me for a week. Get away from me. Let's not communicate. And yet that's not the biblical responsibility. What does the Bible tell us if I have a, if I have a concern, if I have something going on with a brother? How am I supposed to respond? I'm supposed to go to that person. I'm not supposed to talk about that person with everybody else. I'm not supposed to blast it on social media. I'm certainly not to gossip at all. What I am supposed to do is in love and compassion because I want to follow my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and don't want to be caught up in the emotional side of what I want to do. I need to be obedient and go talk to him. Whoever has offended or hurt me. What I love here is there's a willingness to do that. I commend you for that because there is, there is a willingness to follow exactly what Scripture says. And, and that's the reason that those relationships are now strengthened because of that. If we ignore one another, it creates division. If we recognize there's something we don't agree upon, let's talk about it and grow together. It's amazing how that works if we do it God's way. The third thing we see right here is this. Empower others to be productive. 
Paul wrote this. Warn those who are idle. Some translations use the word unruly. It refers to someone who has absolutely zero discipline. No discipline at all, and they're going in the wrong direction. This same Greek word was used by a Roman soldier who went AWOL. They're going in the wrong direction. When you see a family member or a friend going in the wrong direction, what do you do? How do we respond? Imagine yourself driving down the road. You're driving down 64 or 95 or 295. You're going down the road. It's late at night. You guys have all been together. Everybody's exhausted. You've been hunting. You've been fishing. No one slept for 24 hours. And you see your friend in front of you begin to weave back and forth. Because they're, they're nodding off. They're going to sleep. They're exhausted. What do you do in that moment? Does anybody honk the horn? Does anybody flash the lights? Does anybody call them on the phone? And I'm like, use your car stuff to call them on the phone because you're not supposed to have a phone in your hand. But call them on the phone? Do you call them on the phone? Do you do everything in your power to try to grab their attention to make sure that they recognize and see that there is a problem here? Or do we just simply say, hey, I hope you're safe. They ride off into the ditch and we're like, hey, I hope you'll be all right. Let me call 911 for you. They'll come get you. No, you do everything in your power to try to make sure that they're safe. You come in love, but you're doing it to make sure. Now, it might sound loud at times. You're honking that horn, and you're, you ever had somebody honk the horn at you? What is your immediate response when somebody honks the horn at you? Don't you immediately get defensive? Immediately, like, how dare you honk your horn at me? I can honk my horn at anybody I want to if you're driving too slow, but don't you dare honk your horn at me. We get immediately defensive. But somewhere along the way, if they're hurting or, or something's wrong, they're falling asleep, we're trying to grab their attention. Imagine if we're on the front here, Vacation Bible School. You see kids heading towards the road over there. What are you going to do? Hey, guys, don't go over there. you got a four-year-old who's taken off towards the road. Guys, don't go over there. Don't go over there. That's a bad idea to go over there. What are you going to do? You're going to take off after them, aren't you? Now, I, I'm telling you, I think one of the greatest blessings we have at our church is that moat that's in the front ditch right up there. I don't know if any of you have ever seen that thing. I don't think anybody's ever getting to the road if you run into grass right there because of the stones that are there. But the stones hurt. That's a ravine, a ditch. Some of you who haven't seen it before, you'll see it when you leave here today. But if you see your kids running that direction, aren't you going to go and say, hey, come here. Don't go over here. This is going to hurt. You see a child playing with fire. What are you saying? Have fun? Be careful. That might hurt you a little bit. We're going to talk. We're going to share. You see somebody hurting. You see somebody drifting away. We have a responsibility. You know what Paul tells Timothy? Again, context absolutely matters. In the context of these letters, remember what's going on. There were members of the church who were so preoccupied with the return of Jesus that they're not even paying attention to their regular jobs anymore. They're not carrying out their responsibilities to look after their family, to care for one another. Why? Because Jesus is coming back. We know that Jesus is going to come back. So we're just going to sit and we're going to watch. Everything else is going to fall to the wayside. We're not going to work anymore. Somebody else is going to have to bring us food, but we know Jesus is coming back. And you know what, what Paul says? He tells Timothy in 1 Timothy, if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. We still have a responsibility to carry out the tasks in front of us. Paul said that earlier in this, in this letter. He's writing to the church at Thessalonica. Continue working hard. Continue. Why? Because by doing all of those things, yes, you're keeping an eye on the return of Jesus. You know he's coming back. You're excited about that. But you still have these jobs. And by doing them faithfully, by doing them without grumbling, by doing them with compassion and love, people are going to see that something's different about you. The entire world grumbles about their job, don't they? Because it feels like a mundane routine that means absolutely nothing. People get so excited about Friday. Why? Because you don't have to go to work. I get excited about Sundays. Why? Because I feel like I get to go to work. I get excited about Monday because every day is an opportunity. I want us to be as excited about Monday as we are about Friday. Because, you know, every day matters. And every single person you encounter on that day matters. They need Jesus, and you need to tell them about Jesus, and you might be the one God wants to use to plant that seed that the gospel will take root in, and all of a sudden their life gets transformed. So many of you, look at this up here, so many of you have, done, have, done, have taken time out of your day, have taken resources out of your wallet to get together all of these supplies right here, because you know there's the potential that this could plant a seed that will impact somebody's life, and it's a child that you may never see this side of heaven. What if we took the same excitement about that every day? Well, like, you know what? I'm going to share the 
gospel with somebody. I've got a track. I want to give to somebody. Let me just be kind to someone today. That would change absolutely everything. The fourth thing we talk about here is this. Encourage those who are afraid. Paul says this. Encourage the timid. Now, the word timid doesn't mean shy here. It means someone who is fearful of going on. There are times in life when we feel like quitting. I told you, I think that one of the greatest tools that the devil likes to use is to get us so discouraged and so frustrated and so exhausted that we just want to quit, that we just want to walk away. And it exists with everyone, pastors included. Do you know that 80% of the pastors who go into the pastorate leave the pastorate within five years of stepping into ministry? 97% of pastors do not have a close friend within the context of the church. I'm going to tell you I'm part of that 3%, that 3% because I love the people in this church and the connections and the relationships that exist here. Only 10% of people, who, who pastors, who step into ministry ever actually retire from ministry because they step out. They get exhausted. They get run down. They get frustrated with all the things that are going on. I just read a book recently called Fan the Flame. Jim Cimbalo wrote a book, a great book, talking about the frustration and the exhaustion of ministry as a whole. Not just pastors, but everybody. We all get to that point where we're burnt out and, and exhausted, don't we? You ever been there? How do we respond to that? Do we allow the renewal of the spirit within us to let us keep going, to let us keep moving? Think about what Paul endured. Paul, if you ever get into it, look at 1 Corinthians. Paul gives you a wonderful list of all of his accomplishments. I was beaten this many times. I was lashed this many times. I was shipwrecked this many times. I was left for dead here this time. It's just a list like he's bragging on all the accomplishments that he's got. It's pretty amazing. But, you know, I never hear a point with Paul where he talks about ever being burnt out. You never get to that point. That man was involved with this ministry for 20 plus years and was constantly on the run. Man never never really was sure where he was going to sleep one night, to the night. And yet he kept going. Why? Because Jesus mattered. What do we do? Paul's saying, look, encourage those who are afraid. Encourage those who aren't sure how to go on. Encourage those who are so overwhelmed with fear that they're paralyzed. Isaiah 41.10, one of the great passages. I love it. So do not fear. For I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. This, to me, is one of the greatest passages in the book of Isaiah. I absolutely love this passage. But understand the context of it. The people of God are suffering. The people of God have gone through, are, going, are about to go through difficulties. The Babylonian judgment is about to come upon them. Why? Because of the consequences of their sin. They had turned against God. When you look in the early part of Isaiah, the, the, the northern tribes are already gone. 722, the northern tribes are defeated. We're coming into around 605, 604, the Babylonians are coming in. Eventually, 586, the, the Babylonians are going to completely take over and begin to disperse everybody out, spread them out. That's where we get the book of Daniel and all the things going on with that. But what does God say to them in the midst of this hardship, in the midst of this judgment? He says, do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. Why? Because I am your God. Do not be afraid. I am going to strengthen you. I am going to help you. In the midst of this judgment, in the midst of the calamity that's about to come upon you, I will be with you and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's the power hand of God, the righteous right hand. I am going to elevate you. I am going to maintain you. I am going to keep you safe. That is the same response and same reality we must understand in our lives. God is going to guide us. God is going to protect us. God is going to lead us. Now, here's the thing that we have to be willing to do. Be obedient to God no matter what. What if your life was required of you? Would you consider God not protecting you? Some of us in our culture would say, well, that doesn't sound like God's protecting. Yes, but when I die, where am I going? To the presence of Almighty God. Sounds like great protection there, doesn't it? There's no downside to following Jesus. Absolutely zero downside to following Jesus. Encourage those who are weak. The fifth thing we see right here is this, support the weak. Paul wrote this, help the weak. The King James Version says literally, support the weak. And it, it's a good translation because the literal wording means to hold someone up. It's a picture of me approaching someone and lifting them under their shoulders and holding them straight up. Yesterday, I had a chance to go to a wedding. I had a chance to officiate a wedding. And it's the last wedding of the season for me. And that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Last year, I had 26 weddings to do. 
That was exhausting. That was exhausting. And it was one of those things my wife looked at me and she was like, yeah, you're not ever doing that again. I was like, you're exactly right. Because <laughs> I love my wife and I love actually spending time with my wife. But from August to November, I had at least one wedding, if not two weddings a weekend. That's crazy. I loved all the people, but that's still exhausting. I had ten weddings this year. So that was a whole lot better. So I had a chance to go, had a chance to be at the wedding yesterday. And one of the gentlemen who was there had a little, had, had, has diabetes. And so all of a sudden, what does he do? He passes out. And he's there, and it's critical. And all of a sudden, you start watching people move. These are all people he knows very quickly. They're grabbing bags. They're getting the things that they need, whatever he needs to make sure he's okay. They're on the phone with his dad. They're calling 911 to get an ambulance there. But what was absolutely amazing, and he's fine, but what was absolutely amazing was watching the group of people around him love on him and lift him up and encourage him. Hey, don't get up and do this. We've got you. We're going to take care of this. One guy literally letting him lean against his knee, lean against his side of his leg, for, for like a half hour, I'm like, dude, I don't know how you're still standing up. Like at some point, your legs, your feet, everything's going to go numb. But it was out of love and compassion. When you care for somebody, when you love somebody, you're willing to serve. You're willing to sacrifice. But the only way that you can do that is if you know them well enough. There was no hesitation. His friends, these, these, are, all, these are guys in their 20s, mid-20s. I'm watching his buddy, and the only reason we knew that something was going on was because his buddy, who's like 6'4", 230 pounds, is running to the parking lot. And we look, and we're like, what in the world? And immediately, you know, something's going on, but he knew exactly where all the medication was in his friend's car, pulls it out, immediately comes back in there. That is love and compassion. That is also taking a, a very vested interest in the people who are around you. Do you care about people enough? Do you care about people enough to know what's going on in their life? Or do we try to keep them at a distance because life is already hard? We are to support the weak. That is the responsibility. Paul says this, we who are strong, Romans 15, ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Notice what the Bible is always focusing on. It's not us. It's about Jesus. It's about loving Jesus. It's about loving other people because we love Jesus. I've told you, you want the strategy for growing a church? Love God with all that you have. Love people with all that you have. And preach the entire counsel of God's word every time you come together. And you are going to see lives change. It doesn't have, you don't have to get into anything fancy with that. You speak the truth and love people. And there is an authenticity and a genuine nature to that that will transform people's lives. The sixth thing that we have to see here is this. Be patient with everyone. Paul says that right there. Be patient with everyone. Think about transportation in our world. 250 years ago, if you miss a stagecoach, no problem. There'll be another one tomorrow. A hundred years ago, if you miss a train, no problem. There'll be another one in a couple hours. Today, if we have to sit through the light for longer than one cycle, we lose our mind. We, I, I'm going to tell you what, and I'm just going to own this because some of y'all been over there. Anybody ever been up at Short Pump and you just sit in the lights over there? They fit like three people through a light at one time, and in my mind, I'm like, I know we can fit five. You need to move now. That light hits green. You want to lay on the horn, but you're like, I, I got I a I Love Jesus sticker on the back of my truck. I can't move. I can't do this. It's got Berea Baptist on the back. I cannot do that. And it's so funny because we have no problem telling other people to move along, but let us be the front of that line and the light go green and somebody lays on the horn behind us. We're super offended at that point. Like, why don't you slow down and be patient? It'll be fine. We'll get through this. But we are to be patient with everyone. What did Solomon say? A hot-tempered person, Proverbs 15, stirs up conflict. But the one who is patient calms the world is full of people with road rage who yell and shake their fist at everyone. The church doesn't need to be part of that. We have a responsibility to be patient. You know what's interesting? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, what does it say? Love is patient. Love is patient. The Greek word for patient right here is an absolutely beautiful word picture. It comes from two words. The first word is macros, which means large. Not micro, macros, which means large. We use the word, obviously, macro for something big. The second word is thumos, which means anger or boiling point. We are to have a large, large boiling point, which means it should take a whole, whole lot for us to ever get to that point where we're just erupting with anger. We need to have patience. A patient person is someone who doesn't have a short fuse or a hair-trigger temper. They don't become angry 
quickly. Another word might be too long to stop. Do we find ourselves patient today? One person, one pastor shared this. He said, before you lose your patience and strike out at someone, try this. Walk a mile in their shoes. That way, if they're still mad at you, they're barefoot and a mile away, and you have their shoes. The last thing right here is this. Be kind to those who have wronged you. Paul wrote, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, evil for evil, but always try to be kind to each other. Revenge is a human instinct. Instinct. If someone throws an object at your face, your instinct is to raise your hands to protect yourself. If you lose your balance, your hands instinctively move out in front of you to protect yourself. If someone hurts you, your instinct is to hurt them back. Everybody, I, I, it's always interesting to me. People are like, well, I'm an Old Testament Christian. That means eye for an eye. I heard you about that, Noah. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. They want to met out that judgment. But as, as believers in Jesus, that can't be our response. That can't be our response. What does Jesus talk about? Turning the other cheek, correct? Not that we sit in abuse, but we realize that we, have, we, we, are, we are dealing with people who are lost. We live in a world of lost people. Paul said this. In 1 Peter chapter 3, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Look at this. You were called to this. Do not repay evil for evil or insult for insult. You were called to this. Why? So that you might inherit a blessing. You know, I told you the greatest thing that I thank God for every, thing, every single day is the salvation that he has given to me. I could live a thousand lifetimes and, and work to, to be as good as I possibly could, and it would never be enough to repay him for what he has given to me, what he's given to each and every one of us, a gift. And yet so many of us treat others as if they have to earn our favor or our kindness. Do not repay evil with evil. How are people ever going to know who we belong to if we're not willing to show the love of Jesus to them? How we relate to others, how we treat others, speaks much louder than the words we actually speak. We're going to face hostility and rejection in this world, but we are called upon by God to show everyone the love of Jesus. I want to share with you a story in closing. There's a guy by the name of Mickey Cruz. And it's amazing if you ever have a chance to listen to his story. Mickey grew up, and from the time he was three years old until he was about nine years old, he was beaten every day. I mean, mercilessly beaten. He grew up in a household where witchcraft and all kinds of other sorcery were, were performed. His own father looked at him one day, basically called him the son of Satan. It was evil everywhere. The man gets sent to New York to live with a cousin by the time he's 15 years old. He's there six months. He joins up with a gang. Six months later, he's leading the gang. Murder torture, you name it, it consumes him, it overwhelms him. His life revolved around control, and he had a hard heart. Psychiatrists, police officers, everybody who looked at him and talked with him said, this man is a lost cause, there is no hope for him, he is doomed for hell. Literally, that was in the writings that they made about him, this man is doomed for hell. But there was one man, there was one man who wouldn't give up on him. This man was amazing. David Wilkerson. David Wilkerson took a liking to Mickey Cruz and was like, you know what, I'm going to talk to you about Jesus. Every day, David Wilkerson would talk to Mickey Cruz about Jesus. Mickey would punch him. Mickey would beat him up. Mickey would stab him. Mickey would torture that man, David Wilkerson. And every day, David Wilkerson would come back and preach the gospel, teach the gospel, and show that man love. There's one day Mickey Cruz pulled out his switchblade knife and said, I'm going to cut you to pieces. And this is what David Wilkerson said. He said, and if you do, every piece will cry out that Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you this much. Amazingly, one day, the Spirit grabbed a hold of Mickey and transformed his life. As he describes the story, he said, I was laying in bed, and all of a sudden, the brokenness, the, 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 the walls that were, that were guarding my heart were completely broken down. And all of a sudden, it's just my chest, chest is ripped open, and Jesus grabs a hold of my heart, brings it to his lips, kisses it, and then pushes it back into my chest completely and totally transformed. And for the next 50 years, this man has been doing crusades and preaching and teaching the gospel everywhere that he goes. 
All because one man was willing to battle through the danger and share the gospel. David Wilkerson, any of us could have looked at Nikki and said, that man is a lost cause. There's absolutely no hope for him at all. He's going to hell and left him alone. And David Wilkerson says, I'm not doing that. I'm going to love that man, and I want that man to know Jesus loves him. I've told you, there are people at the beginning of this year who I baptized this year who've given their life to Jesus this year. I was actually joking with them after the 830 service because they were both out there. He's like, they, they were like, we need to take a picture of this. I'm like, yes, we do. Because these were two of the hardest men I'd ever met. And there was no chance of them ever giving their life to Jesus. And then all of a sudden you're baptizing them in a river. You're seeing them join in Bible studies. You're seeing this transformation. And the hardness is all of a sudden gone from their life. And they want to share Jesus. Are they growing? Are they learning? Absolutely. But there's a passion to serve and to love Christ. If we're obedient to the gospel, to sharing the gospel, we're going to see those miracles take place over and over and over again. Are we willing to love like that? sacrifice that much for Jesus. Because if we are, we will see lives changed. I challenge each and every one of us, have that kind of radical love in a world that is desperately in need of the truth of the gospel of Jesus. Because if we're willing to embrace that, we're going to see a transformation like we didn't think was possible. And as we know every week, we're as close to Jesus as we want to be. The question we ask is, how close do you want to be? That, my friends, is entirely up to you. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we come to you and thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace and goodness, for your love and mercy, for the hope we have in you, and the salvation that comes through Jesus. Father, we know that you're working in ways that we can't possibly begin to understand. I pray if there's somebody here today who's never given their life to you, that today would be that day. This would be that moment, that time, that they would surrender everything. Lord, if they need to follow you in baptism, what a beautiful day to do that. What a great opportunity to do that. Let this be the moment. There's there's no reason to hold back. God, if they need to join this church, let's have that conversation and see where God is moving because it is not by accident that we are here together today. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. Guide us today, and may all that we do bring honor, praise, and glory to you. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Out of my bondage, sorrow, and light, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come. I come to thee, out of my sickness, into thy health, out of my heart, and into thy wealth, out of my sin, and into thyself, Jesus, I come. I come into thy glorious king of thy cross. Jesus, I come to I come to thee, out of unrest and arrogant pride, Jesus I come, Jesus I come.
serve an awesome God, amen. I mean, we serve a powerful God working in some pretty amazing ways. So Shiloh, I'm going to get you to come over here with me, amen. She's coming with her mom, Jessica Payne, you can come over here too. They've all been a part of this, but this is one of those situations, again, it's a great chance to be able to come together because a couple of weeks ago, Shiloh gave her life to Jesus and accepted him as Lord and Savior. So she wants to come and share that. So I just, I wanted to, to come up here and make sure that you guys knew about that so that you can encourage her. Uh, in the weeks to come, and we can go into the river in January and get baptized. It'll be absolutely amazing. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not really, but we can. <laughs> and then Vicky, Vicky's over here. Come over here, Vicky. Vicky is coming. She's she's been here for what over a year now, and God's been using her in some pretty amazing ways in the choir and all throughout the church. And she's coming today and wanting to officially join the church. So can somebody give me a motion that we accept her? Somebody second it. All in favor, say Amen. Amen. So these, these wonderful ladies are going to be hanging out on the side right over here at the end of worship. Come over there, hug on them, give them a high five, tell them how much you love them and are praying for them because God is working in some pretty amazing ways. Anything else, Bill? Well, I'm going to sing the doxology as we close today after the prayer. <laughs> Almighty God, we come to you and thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace and goodness. Again, for your love and mercy. We thank you for lives that are changed. Lord, I pray that you would give us the strength and courage as we step away from this place to share the gospel because you have the power to change lives. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. May all that we do be pleasing to you. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Praise God. Thank you. 